everyone to the Civil War Museum's new online program, Coffee and Hardtack. Um, this is going to be a bi-weekly program that will feature myself and Doug Dahman from the Civil War Museum in Kenosha. Um, and we're going to be interviewing different Civil War historians and educators uh, to kind of get a feel for what's out there right now. Um, I'm Jen Edgington. I'm the Curator of Social Studies Education at the Kenosha Museum's campus, and with me is Doug Dahman, who is um, manager of the education department and curator of the Civil War Museum. And we're extremely happy to have um, our first guest, Nick Sacco, with us from the National Park Service. So Nick, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Sure, yeah. So I'm a park ranger at Ulysses S. Grant National Historic Site in St. Louis, Missouri. So we're a little farther south, but um, we interpret a range of different topics related to Grant. Uh, Grant lived in St. Louis for about five years right before the Civil War from 1854 to 1859, but his wife, Julia Dent Grant, grew up in St. Louis. And so the house that we take care of, it's called Whitehaven, and uh, this was the home that Julia Dent Grant grew up in. Uh, Grant, after finishing at West Point, he was stationed at Jefferson Barracks, which is a military post about five miles south of Whitehaven. He gets in contact with the Dent family. Ulysses and Julia meet each other. They fall in love. They get married in St. Louis, and, uh, and then Grant left the Army, and he's going to have this five-year experiment as a farmer in St. Louis. So uh, it's an opportunity for us to talk about uh, not just Grant, but to talk about Julia and her family, the Dent family, and to also talk about slavery as well. Whitehaven was a plantation before the Civil War. Uh, it was 850 acres in size and upwards of 30 enslaved African Americans uh, worked on the property. And Grant himself owned an enslaved man named William Jones. So um, it's really interesting as a historian because we're not a Civil War battlefield. We're we can talk about military history, but it's really a lot more about Grant, the person. And it's a lot about the politics and culture of 19th century America. And of course, uh, Grant bought the property after the war. So when he's president, Grant owns the Whitehaven property himself. So um, we have the opportunity to talk about antebellum history, the Civil War, and Reconstruction, about 40 years worth of time. So uh, it keeps me on my toes because uh, visitors come in with a whole range of interest and questions about Grant's life. <laughs> Nick, do you find that your visitors are often surprised to, to find a Ulysses S. Grant National Historic Site in St. Louis? I mean, you're certainly used to hearing about him in Galena, Illinois, or Vicksburg or the, the Virginia battlefield site, certainly, but St. Louis, it's a bit off the beaten path when you think of Ulysses S. Grant. Can you talk about their responses and the responses to your site that you get from the public? Sure, absolutely. And you'd be surprised how many people in St. Louis say the same thing about <laughs> Grant. Uh, but, you know, Grant, as a, uh, as, a, as a soldier in the U.S. Army, he was always a man on the move. And the longest he ever lived in one place as an adult was the White House, living there for eight years. And so, oddly enough, the five years he lived at Whitehaven as a farmer, it's the second longest uh, that he ever lived in one place. And uh, so I, I think there's an interesting um, contrast with, say, somebody like Robert E. Lee. Now, Robert E. Lee, he was in the Army, moved around a lot as well. But when the Civil War breaks out, he talks about, well, I, I, I can't turn my back on my native state and, and whatever the state of Virginia does in terms of its allegiance, I'm going with Virginia. But Grant, uh, the very first sentence in his personal memoirs is, I'm an American. He wasn't an Ohioan, an Illinoisan, or a Missourian. He was an American. And so uh, St. Louis is just one of those steps along the way. And Grant himself even recalled when he was president that St. Louis was one of the only places he ever felt a connection to. With all this moving around, um, he met his future wife, he started his family. A lot of meaningful relationships were established in St. Louis, and so it was a, a place of great importance for Grant, even though um, maybe he didn't live there uh, for a particularly long time. Yeah. Um Kind of along the same lines, we, we talked about people being surprised that there's a grant house in St. Louis or outside St. Louis, but really 
I know that you, you talk about the 40 years of history, right? And especially how it pertains to Grant and his family. So is there something in his story that really surprises people that maybe they don't know about Grant when they get to the grounds that really um, they kind of are super surprised by? Sure. It, you know, it might kind of seem like a basic answer, but I think for a lot of folks, maybe not so much today, but for a long time, the story that a lot of people would hear about Grant when they're in school is that he was a general and president, but that he was, um, his presidency was, was full of corruption. Sometimes you hear claims that he was a butcher and had no regard for the lives of his soldiers. And so I think just the, the, the power of place, the power of, of standing in front of Grant's home and learning about his personal life and his family um, I can't tell you how many times people have been like, you know, there's a lot more to the story than that. And uh, I, I think sometimes Grant, the myth, Grant, the statue, I mean, there's a stat uh, at the U.S. Capitol. There's a statue of U.S. Grant defending our nation's capital in Washington, D.C. And I just feel like our role as park rangers at the Grant site is to really humanize Grant and sort of maybe tear down sort of the, the statues and the, and the myths and really try to get down to who this person was fundamentally. And uh, being a loving husband and, and father is, is a huge part of that story. So it, in a way, it's kind of unremarkable, but at the same time, uh, just kind of bringing that humanity back to Grant's life can really, uh, uh, it can really sort of make a good impression on visitors and kind of question maybe some of the previous stereotypes and understandings of Grant. Sure. Nick, can you talk a little bit about the family dynamic at the home? I mean, Grant had been gone away from his wife for quite some time before coming to St. Louis, and now he's moving into his father-in-law's home. Um, was that at all uncomfortable for him? Uh, <laughs> how did they get along? What was the family dynamic at the home? Sure. Uh, it's uh, it, it's kind of all of the above there. Grant in Ohio, he, he grows up in a town, uh, Georgetown, Ohio, Southwest Ohio. And Grant's parents are, they, they love their children, but they're vocalized, you know, hey, you're doing great today. I love you. They're just kind of, they're kind of, be kind of cold sometimes with, uh, with their children. And so when Grant comes to Jefferson Barracks and he meets the Dent family of Whitehaven, it's a different atmosphere. Julia's parents are very outgoing. They're very vocal. They're uh, very welcoming. And, and Grant genuinely feels comfortable when he starts coming to Whitehaven and visiting while he's stationed at Jefferson Barracks. And so uh, a lot of times we talk about the politics, sure. Grant and his father-in-law, especially when it came to the question of uh, civil war and secession, disunion, um, they didn't always see eye to eye with each other. And um, both men were pretty open about their, uh, their points of view and their political opinions and read the newspapers quite often. So I think there's definitely some tension there. The in-laws didn't like each other either. Grant's parents didn't come to St. Louis for the wedding. Uh, reportedly, Jesse Grant, Ulysses' father, called the Dent family a tribe of slaveholders. So balancing the tensions between the family is, is a very difficult uh, struggle. But at the same time, I, I do think Grant felt a sense of uh, comfort around the Dent family and, and a welcoming, warm environment that he really uh, uh, adapts and he really uh, likes that part of it. So even though the Grants and Dents had their disagreements, I think, I think Ulysses at times, you know, he maybe was a little bit closer to his in-laws than we may acknowledge at times. Um, I know you mentioned Ohio a little bit, but um, our museum, we focus on the upper Midwest. So have you found any grant connections with the upper Midwest? Yeah, there's there's definitely some connections with the Upper Midwest, and the uh, you know probably the most notable one is, is the experience living in Galena, Illinois. Uh, Ulysses' father Jesse Grant was a successful business owner. He was in the leather goods business. He started off as a tanner and eventually had his own leather goods stores. He had a number of them, and one of the leather goods stores he owned was in Galena, Illinois. And so uh, when farming doesn't work out here in St. Louis, 
the Grant family will move to uh, Galena in early 1860, uh, 1860. And so for about a year, Grant is going to be working with a couple of his brothers at the leather goods store. He's going to be working as a clerk. And Grant, in his personal memoirs, he actually recalled that during this time while living in Galena, uh, it was very, uh, very frequent of him to travel to um, the states around that area there. So you kind of visualize on a map, you've got Illinois, Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, sort of like a of four corners right there. He recalled his memoirs that he traveled to those states uh, quite often. And I was looking through Grant's papers and uh, New Year's Day in 1861, uh, Ulysses is going to write a letter back to Julian Galena and he actually had stayed in Prairie du Chien for four days uh, conducting business for the leather goods store. So he specifically mentions Prairie du Chien and, and spending time up there. Now, after the Civil War, the residents of Galena bought a mansion for the Grant family. And that is the actual house that you can tour today. So the house that he lived in before the war, privately owned and not open to the public, but that mansion is open. And um, again, going through Grant's papers, I saw that he had written a letter to his caretaker back here in Whitehaven, and he mentions that he had a horse that he was taking care of up in Wisconsin. So the Grants would vacation in Galena, and he didn't specify where, but apparently he had a horse somewhere in Wisconsin that was being taken care of during his presidency. And uh, and, and Grant is gonna uh, campaign, so to speak, in the 1868 presidential election. Uh, not like today where they traveled the country, Grant stays home at, in Galena that summer, and he's gonna get the news that he's elected president of the United States while staying in Galena. So uh, a strong connection to the, to the town of Galena and a little bit of a connection to Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin as well. Nick, just a, a sidebar to your conversation. A couple years ago, we, we did, sponsored a, a single day bus trip from the museum in Kenosha and we, we went to Galena for the day. And uh, our local guide, Scott Wolf, was able to get us access to the home that Ulysses and Julia lived in before the Civil War. Uh, Scott was good friends with the, pre the, the present owner. And so um, we started out kind of in the front yard and we weren't sure whether or not we were going to get access inside the home. And the, the owner couldn't have been more gracious. We had a great time talking with him about the home and seeing some of the interior of it. So um, that's really it was, cool. Yeah, it was a it was an amazing day um, to be there and to get access to that. Love your stories. Do you have a personal favorite? story about Grant while he was at your site? Uh, maybe something personal that you particularly like or connect with? Yeah, there's a, there's a number of stories to, to tap into, but one that I, I get a real kick out of is the, the Grant's four children. Um, Ulysses and Julia had three boys and a girl, and all four of them, when they were growing up, they thought that they were the favorite child of their parents. Uh, Fred Grant recalled that you know, he was the oldest son and he actually accompanied his father on the battlefield at, at various points in the Civil War. He was actually uh, with his father for a lot of the Vicksburg campaign in Mississippi. Ulysses Jr., the second son, he was named after his father and he went on to uh, study law at both Harvard and Columbia and so he was praised for his intelligence and he thought he was the favorite one. And then Nellie Grant, the only daughter, she was born on the 4th of July, and Ulysses would tell her that uh, the fireworks on the 4th of July were for her birthday. Everybody was celebrating her birthday. So as the only daughter, she was the one that was most favored. And then Jesse Grant, the youngest son, um, he thought he was the favored because uh, being, being the youngest one, he was with his parents the most during both the Civil War and Grant's presidency. He lived in the White House through the entirety of Grant's presidency. So he thought he was the favorite. So I guess you're doing a really good job as a parent if all of your kids think that they're the favorite uh, of the parents. I, I just get a kick out of that story. I love that story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, and kind of on the other end, unfortunately, um, I had a question. Do you is there anything about Grant that you find hard to reconcile or deal with? And maybe not just even you, but the public themselves, when they visit the site, is there something that they grapple with, with Grant? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think it's really important to stress that um, we as park rangers and historians, 
Um, we're not looking, I've said this before, we're not defense attorneys. We're, we're not looking to fully exonerate our historical subjects of, of all their mistakes. And that's not my role. I'm, I'm trying to get to an accurate understanding of Grant. And so, you know, two things for me that really stick out. One would be uh, General Orders Number 11. This is a, an order that was issued in uh, 1862. Grant, uh, his forces are in Kentucky, and uh, Grant was having problems with smugglers who were bringing cotton, bringing it through uh, the, uh, the blockade of the Confederacy, and then illegally smuggling and selling cotton into the North. And to try to cut down on this, rather than writing a general order specifically against smugglers, he writes uh, the general order banning Jews from his military line. And uh, President Lincoln's gonna rescind this order a few days later, and Grant did go on to apologize later on for this action, but it's a black mark on his record. Uh, and he, he must have learned about some sort of prejudice against Jews somewhere down the line, and uh, it's hard to excuse that act. And then the second one would be um, his policies, his Indian policies when he's president of the United States. And uh, Grant really did try to bring about meaningful change he opposed some of the more extreme rhetoric of people like Sherman and Sheridan who just wanted to exterminate all Native American people. Grant rejects that. And he actually appoints a Native American man, E. Lee Parker, to become the first um, uh, Indian to be sec uh, in charge of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So he, he is trying to bring about genuine change. But at the same time, Grant embraces uh, manifest destiny and westward expansion and the, the, support, of the, the support of the idea that settlers should be making their way out into the West and uh, treaties are not always enforced and there's genuine uh, harm to various Native American tribes during Grant's presidency. We see some of the worst battles between the U.S. Army and uh, various Native American tribes like the Modoc War and the Battle of Little Bighorn. And that's an outgrowth of sort of this forced assimilation plan where the Grant administration, you know, they want Native Americans to stop hunting and learn how to become farmers and become Christianized and uh, um, do away with traditional clothing and embrace Christianity and Christian family structures. And um, it didn't really matter whether or not these Native Americans wanted to do that. Um, this was sort of the plan they had so that they could become U.S. citizens someday. Uh, and again, it, it, you know, whether or not Native Americans felt the same way was, was not so much part of the equation. So that's, that's something very difficult to reconcile with. And for really all of Civil War history, it's not just about the North and the South, but it's also about control and conquest of the West as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know we're, all three of us very much like to talk about Grant. We like Grant. So sometimes it is hard to hear those um, more upsetting parts of history that oftentimes it's kind of easy to ignore and focus on the good stuff too, because you're right. I personally, I love learning about Grant because of his love of his family. Um, I know that he's a strong leader and I know that he played such a, a amazing role in the civil war. But to me, the, the letters between him and his wife are what draws me to him and also like why I want to continue his story and make sure everyone knows it because yeah, he everyone kind of sees that stereotype like you were saying of him being this leader, but he also was just like a really nice guy to his family. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm glad that we, we can have this open conversation. Yeah, and, and just, you know, real briefly, I'll just add that, you know, one of the challenges of, of good history is just being able to live with nuance and complexity and, and unanswered questions. And, um, you know, there's sometimes tensions between, you know, good things people are doing and maybe things that were not as good and just trying to live with it and reconcile is a part of just better understanding the past and all of it, whether it's good or bad. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think we have one final question. Sure. <laughs> All right, Doug, do you have any more questions? The only other thing that kind of popped up for me as we were talking today is, do you get any sense when he was at, at the site in Missouri, you know, he was officially out of the U.S. Army, did he ever have a sense that he might return? Or did you think that he had kind of filed that portion of his life away and he kind of felt that that was a chapter that had closed and that was something that, you know, that 
who could have foreseen seven, eight years into the future what would come for him? Um, had he kind of reconciled that his army career was over and that he was moving on to uh, different opportunities in life? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, when Grant first moves to Whitehaven in 1854, that, that was most certainly the plan that in the long term, he was just going to be this quiet, humble, successful farmer in St. Louis and just kind of go about the rest of his life. And, uh, you know, looking back at the good old days with the Army, but just kind of moving on from that chapter of his life. But, uh, you know, circumstances change. The farming didn't work out. Uh, the war breaks out. and uh, But then even after the Civil War, there was some loose talk about the Grants retiring back to St. Louis. And, and a couple of things I would point out to that end, um, we have a very large Victorian-style uh, cemetery called Bell Fountain Cemetery in North St. Louis. And uh, the Grant family did put a down payment uh, on a cemetery plot in Bell Fountain Cemetery when Grant was president. Um, for whatever reason, that didn't work out. And of course, he's buried in New York City today. But um, they, had, they had, had kind of moved forward with this idea of Ulysses and Julie being buried in St. Louis. And Grant's purchasing of the Whitehaven property after the Civil War, he's turning it into a horse breeding operation. He's investing tens of thousands of dollars to improve the land, to build a horse stable. Um, so I, I really think there was a, a long-term interest in retiring to this, you know, this horse farm back in St. Louis, back at Whitehaven, again, sort of uh, enjoying the sunset years of his life. But then the Republican Party comes knocking and says, we want you to run for president. And then it's another thing that uh, kind of changes his original plans. And uh, so the Grants did come back to vacation at Whitehaven after the war, but ultimately uh, the Grants moved to New York City after the presidency, largely because three of the four grandchildren moved to New York City. All right, I think we're running out of time. So I have my last question. So if people want to learn more about Grant or his family, do you have any recommendations for further exploration, be it reading or watching or listening or anything like that? Yeah, well, you know, there's a, a good number of Grant biographies on the market that do talk or speak to this dynamic within the Grant family. Uh, and a lot of folks know about the Ron Chernow book, and that, that one's obviously the bestseller, but it is a thousand pages long. So uh, a couple other books that I really like, um, uh, Brooks Simpson has an excellent biography called Triumph Over Adversity that uh, highlights the Grant family dynamic and, and the years at, at Whitehaven and in St. Louis. And so I like that book. That's a good one. And then um, there's another book I have right by me that's a, it's a short book. And uh, it's written by a guy named Josiah Bunting. And it's about 150 pages long, but it's a, a broad overview of Grant's life and talks a little bit about the years in St. Louis here as well. Um, I, ha I don't know what it's going to be like, but the History Channel is going to be having their Grant documentary on uh, Memorial Day weekend that uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and Steven Spielberg and all the Hollywood folks uh, were behind the production of this. Uh, three, it's a three-part documentary, so I, I have to reserve judgment on how accurate it's going to be, but it is something that is going to be uh, going live pretty soon, and all of us here in St. Louis will be will be watching with much interest to see uh, how accurate it is. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Nick. I think that this was really helpful and informative about Grant, but also it was just really great to talk to you. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, well, we hope. Much, Nick. Yeah, hopefully people can come visit sometime in the near future. Um, but we really appreciate you doing this. So thank you so much. And to everyone watching, we'll see you for the next Coffee and Heart Tap. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you.